Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to talk to you about performance-based curriculum architecture design, which addresses performance-based onboarding and ongoing development. Curriculum architecture design is also known as CAD. A curriculum architecture design effort does not create any new content. It really just establishes what are the performance-based requirements what are the enabling knowledge and skills that are required to perform? And then it assesses existing content for its reuse potential. Reuse either as is or after modification. It takes all of that data and then designs a modular set of instruction, instructional systems, if you will, that addresses the authentic performance requirements back on the job. A training and development path that's created as a result of the design phase then leads to a prioritization phase where executives, leaders of the enterprise determine what are the priorities given the gaps that exist. The development of a path, or paths in this case, enable leadership to visually see what training, instruction, exists already as is or needing modification that presents the gaps in that total system of instruction for prioritization. Those gaps that aren't addressed are left to informal and social means for learning. There are four phases to a curriculum architecture design project as I've been using them since the early 80s. As a curriculum architecture design doesn't create any new content, it leads to my version of ADDIE, MCD and IAD, which stands for Modular Curriculum Development and Instructional Activity Development. My approach to curriculum architecture design involves using a standard process with standard outputs, standard project teams, and this makes it all very predictable in terms of what is the time burden and what's the schedule for that time invested by all the parties involved in a curriculum architecture design effort. When I talk about instruction, I'm talking about job aids and then communications, education, and training, because sometimes we only need to create an awareness or a knowledge versus skills development based on the target audience's prior knowledge. The training path organizes instructional content for onboarding, including organizational orientations, orientations to the performance itself, which I call areas of performance. Areas of performance are also known as major duties, key results areas, accomplishments, etc. The last part of onboarding for me is to address the immediate survival of knowledge and skills that are required by the target audiences as they take the job. The training and development path then goes into ongoing development, intermediate knowledge and skills, if you will, advanced knowledge and skills, and then developmental knowledge and skills for the next probable job assignment of the target audience. In this case, the supervisor path leads to the zone manager path in this example from back in 2003. In this path example, development was addressed in the 3000 series of modular content. Whether the training and development path is a straight path, a path of menus, or just one open menu, they need to be as rigorous as required by the job itself and the consequences for performance competence, but also as flexible as feasible. I've been using these three modes of instruction since 1982, group-paced, self-paced, 
and coached. Gaps that are not resourced by the leadership are left to informal and social means of learning. Not everything that can be identified by an instructional designer or an instructional systems designer or a learning experience designer warrants being addressed. Those are business decisions. The training and development path enables production of an individual training and development planning guide. That allows the individual, perhaps with their supervisor, to down select, to identify what needs to be addressed, put on the plan, and then made relevant and sequenced appropriately to the needs back on the job. The PATH provides a visual for assessing the curriculum architecture. When the content exists, it's given a full red circle. When it partially exists and might require modification, it gets a half circle. When there is nothing at all in place, it gets an open circle. This allows management to simply scan the path and read the titles and the deployment methods and the estimated lengths to make business decisions about what gaps to address. Important in the training and development path as I've been doing them is the analysis data. It's critical. Is it accurate? Is it complete? And is it appropriate? I capture this data in a performance model that articulates what are the outputs, what are the tasks, what are the various roles and responsibilities, and what are the current state gaps in performance from people who are not master performers. That leads to the systematic deriving of the enabling knowledge and skill. That key data then feeds the design of a training and development path. And when I design a training and development path, I'm most often working with master performers who can guide that design effort because they've been there, they've done that, and they typically know what's needed. Again, I break training and development paths into an onboarding component and an ongoing development. Let's review those now. Organizational orientations to the organization and its structure. So you might look at the enterprise itself, the various divisions or strategic business units, the functions such as sales or marketing or finance or HR and provide an orientation to those so that people understand who does what and where does that happen in our organization. The next important component of onboarding for me is areas of performance. These are orientations, advanced organizers if you will, of what the job is and what needs to be accomplished in those segments of performance. Last but not least are the immediate survival knowledge and skills that are required as someone takes the job. Some things can be deferred till later to the ongoing portion of the training and development path, but others should not be. When we go into the ongoing development portions of the path, we address the intermediate knowledge and skills. We address the advanced knowledge and skills. And then lastly, we might be preparing people for the next logical step in the progression. It may be to uh, a level two or three of the job family classification, or it may be for the next logical job, or it may be uh, more widespread and looking at various logical options for where would somebody go from this job to the next in their career progression. Again, a curriculum architecture design doesn't create any new content that happens later afterwards in the MCD and IAD effort, modular curriculum development or instructional activity development. I've been doing this so long that um, my business partners and I were published an article back in September 1984 in Training Magazine about curriculum architecture design. I've been presenting on this since 
the fall of 1984 when I presented at the Chicago chapter of NSPI, the National Society for Performance and Instruction, and the next spring I presented at their national conference. A curriculum architecture has always been about identifying the component modules of training or instruction, providing for flexible sequence path through the curriculum to meet the real needs of the target audience, and identify the estimated lengths, delivery methods, and development priorities, especially for the gap modules. This is all targeted to support the performance requirements of an individual job or a function, multiple jobs. My 1999 book, Lean ISD, addresses curriculum architecture design as one of three instructional systems design methodology sets that I've developed as a consultant since 1982. That book won a 2002 award from ISPI, my professional home. In 2011, I updated Lean ISD and reconfigured that content into a series of books. And so one of the books focuses specifically on curriculum architecture design. This is January 2021. At this point in my career, I've completed 77 curriculum architecture design projects, including one when I was an employee back at Motorola in 1981. But since 1982, as an instructional systems design consultant, I've completed 76 curriculum architecture design projects, some with multiple paths, like this one that was done for NAVC for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard back in 2003. Back in 1983, some of our clients asked me to develop their staff in my methods for analysis and design. Then they had me work on the staff's project planning and management skills as well. But I've been doing this for my own staff in a consulting organization since 1982. Let's improve performance together. Performance is often a collaborative effort. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. Leverage your current master performers for higher performance in curriculum architecture design, addressing onboarding development all the way through to ongoing development. 